Hello, and thank you for that kind introduction. I am the co-author of a few children's books published by Imagination Press, and I'm going to, be going to be talking to you about a couple of them today with the disclaimer you see on the screen. Something Happened in Our Town is a children's book about racial injustice that I wrote with two friends, both psychologists. How did this little picture book about racial injustice come to be called offensive on the evening news and earn the number six spot on the top 10 most challenged books of 2020 and become a New York Times bestseller? The book grew out of our uh, growing concern about the widely publicized, disproportionate police killings of African-American men, women, and children. We wondered how children understood these events and how the news reports affected them. What kinds of conversations were children and parents having about these police killings? And what conclusions were children drawing in the absence of informed conversations about why the police killings were happening? As psychologists, we knew that these questions were probably answered differently for black families than for white families. After all, many black families prepare their children for encounters with police who may view them as older and more dangerous than they really are, often with harmful results. This talk is part of healthy racial ethnic socialization for black youth in the U.S. In contrast, most white families don't even talk about racism, much less race. We were familiar with the work that psychologists had done on racial identity development, particularly for youth of color, and we wanted to use those findings to inform our book. But we also wanted our book to have focus on the perspectives of white families as well as black families. And for white readers, we wanted our book to promote a healthy racial identity without supporting racial, without supporting white privilege. This was not a project I could do by myself, nor did I have the skills or lived experience to do the topic justice alone. So I invited two friends, Marietta Collins and Ann Hazard, who you see on the screen. And in the process, I learned why it takes multiple authors to write a children's book, or at least the kind of book we wanted to write. There are many tasks, each with different deadlines, some requiring different skills. There's the story creation, there's the story revision, the feedback about the illustrator sketches, the note at the back of the book, the online resources, and then there's book promotion. Before writing the story, we read other available children's books that tackle the topic of racial injustice. There were very few books that featured modern, realistic examples of racism. In fact, most of the stories about diversity and justice featured animal characters, abstract shapes, and allegory. We decided early on that our book would feature human characters, present the police killing of an unarmed black man as an example of systemic racism, and show adults and kids talking about it directly. Some might argue that it is cruel and harmful to present young children with the violent reality of racially motivated police violence. My response, it's cruel and harmful to live in that reality, and it's dangerous to deny that it exists. Who are we protecting when we withhold information about systemic racism? Are we protecting children? or the status quo. Children deserve the truth, and they can handle it, given support. Even more important, we need to say the truth. As an author, finding your way into a story is a bit like riding a bike. It's hard to get started, but once you get going, it gets easier. This entryway into a story is called voice in the book industry. It's the personality behind a piece of writing. It's that combination of vocabulary, point of view, tone, and syntax that helps the story flow and hang together. For me, 
the voice started with these sentences on the first page. Something bad happened in our town. The news was on the TV, the radio, and the internet. The grown-ups didn't think the kids knew about it, but the kids in Ms. Garcia's class heard some older kids talking about it, and they had questions. The story follows two children, Emma, who is white, and Josh, who is black. Both kids talk with their parents about an incident in which a police officer shot an unarmed black man. We had three messages we wanted to convey. The first message was about systemic racism. But how do you present this abstract concept to young children who don't even know how society works? Young children understand the concept of fairness, at least in an interpersonal context. But systemic racism permeates our institutional and social structures, operates at many levels, and is often perpetuated without awareness or intent to harm. So we decided to use a different vocabulary. We decided to use the term pattern. This is probably the spread that got us in the most trouble. As the older brother character says, cops stick up for each other, and the father character says, we can't always count on them to do what's right. We wrote these sentences to capture the experiences and concerns of many African-American people with police officers. These concerns derive or are consistent with well-documented patterns of racial bias in many aspects of policing and the criminal justice system. Our book does not vilify the police in any way, and we do not encourage children to resist or defy the police. The police killing is presented as a mistake that is part of a pattern of systemic racism, like the pattern exemplified by residential and school segregation. The second message was about value in diversity. To communicate this message, we not only showed what Josh and Emma could accomplish together, we also featured the older sister's comment in reaction to a hypothetical birthday party for Emma to which her black friends were not invited. The older sister says, you would be missing out because you never know who's going to be your best friend. The third message of our book was that kids can recognize and confront acts of racial discrimination. At the end of the story, Josh and Emma apply what they've learned from their parents to the situation of a new student in their classroom who is excluded from a soccer game. The new student is described as learning English, and he's excluded from the soccer game because of his peers' bias against him. Josh and Emma step up and insist that he play the game. The last sentence of the book is, and just like that, Emma and Josh gained a new friend and started a better pattern in their school. We knew that our book would take some parents out of their comfort zone. So we are grateful that Imagination Press allowed us an extended note to parents and caregivers at the back of the book. The note gave us an opportunity to provide a rationale and general tips for discussing racial injustice with young children, along with the other topics you see on the screen. We even included 12 sample parent-child dialogues, giving parents words to say, for example, when their child says, I don't want to play with Jada because she's black, or for African-American kids, uh, why is Keisha's skin lighter than mine? She says she's prettier. Something Happened in Our Town was published in 2018. We read the book at libraries, churches, and schools, though in Atlanta, it was difficult to get permission to read the book in schools that served primarily white students. As you all know, in the summer of 2020, George Floyd was murdered by police officers in Minneapolis. And suddenly, there were many posts on social media about how to talk with young children about racially motivated police violence. 
At least one Hollywood celebrity recommended our book, and sales took off, as this graph shows. As of 2023, there are 100,000 copies in print. Despite some positive recognition for the book, it was not well received by everyone. During the pandemic, some teachers read the book aloud on video conferencing platforms, uh, mostly to students in third, fourth, and fifth grades. This led to controversy with some parents attempting to get the book banned from school classrooms and libraries. The book was challenged for divisive language and because it was thought to promote anti-police views. Challenges were mounted across the country and not just in designated market areas where the book sold best. This slide shows states where we know the book was banned or challenges. Uh, challenge. I'm sure there are others. And the bans continue. Just two months ago, our book was banned from a high school in Missouri. I repeat, a high school. Sometimes the challenges were not successful. In Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, hundreds of concerned residents showed up at an annual school board meeting to successfully defeat an email campaign to ban five books, including ours. On the way in, parents passed out signs that said, teach truth. It was an honor to be involved with the Children's Theater Company's production of the play, Something Happened in Our Town, based on our book. Written by Cheryl West, the production follows Josh and Emma as they struggle to make sense of the killing of an unarmed black man by a white police officer. Attending this performance in Minneapolis last year with my two co-authors was a very powerful experience for all of us. And we're so pleased that the play was made available to many students ages seven and up in the Minneapolis-St. Paul community. So, did we advance social change? Did we do it? It's hard to say. I'd like to think that our book contributed to a national conversation about how to talk with children about race and racism. And I'm certainly glad to see that there's more attention to this topic now than there was six years ago. Recently, my co-author Marietta Collins and I turned our attention to the climate crisis. In thinking about creating a book for kids on this topic, we had questions. What do kids understand about the climate crisis? What should they know? How do we balance the certainty of damage and loss with hope for a sustainable future? How do we educate and support kids, families, and communities in taking collective climate action? To answer these questions, we had to do a deep dive into a diverse literature featuring climate educators, um, science communicators, investigative journalists, uh, philosophers, activists, as well as psychologists. We learned that the real question posed by the climate crisis is, how do we live now? How do we live in the face of limited resources, a growing population, and a warming climate? We realize that the climate crisis is not just about climate, but also about justice and economics. As policymakers the world over decide which towns, populations, resources, and industries will be saved and which will be sacrificed. I still needed a voice, a channel to find my way into the story. I wanted to come up with some words that would resonate with what children feel when they think about the climate change or even when they think about the planet. I ended up with words that I feel and perhaps that we all feel when we think about climate change. The planet is so big and I'm small. What can I do? 
The story follows the narrator as she learns about climate change from her parents and then bands together with her classmates to try to figure out what they can do to help the planet. They petition the school to get rid of disposable lunch trays, like the kind you see here, and instead buy trays that can be washed and reused. As is often the case with advocacy efforts, there is pushback. But ultimately, with the support of their parents and community, the kids ultimately prevail, learning the lesson, if we do our part, nature heals itself. In the note, we included what we hope are strong advocacy messages about climate justice and climate action. We included information about the impact of the climate crisis on humans, how to talk to young kids about it, child-friendly definitions of vocabulary words, and sample child parent questions and answers. Many climate activists and scientists believe that we should prioritize collective climate action over individual consumer choice in responding to the climate crisis. In our note, we include both types of solutions. We encourage parents to partner with their children in taking climate actions like planting trees or reducing food waste, and we encourage parents and children to enjoy the natural world. But we also hope that our story and note inspires kids and parents to organize collective action to promote a sustainable planet. So, I've talked to you about my two books, and now I want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages for psychology in using media to promote social change. There are many advantages. The first is relevance. Social change is baked into APA's mission and strategic goals. All of us are called upon to make a positive impact on critical societal issues. Advocacy is a functional competency defined for most specialties within the American Board of Professional Psychology. Use of media allows us to expand our reach. A psychologist working in a clinic or school setting can improve the lives of dozens of people in a given year, but a psychologist with a successful podcast or YouTube channel can improve the lives of hundreds or even thousands. And we can reach audiences with more diversity than that represented by our consumers, clients, colleagues, and students. Given the speed of information sharing on the internet and in social media, our messages can quickly find a national audience. And of course, any discussion of the merit of being present should include consideration of the cost of being absent. What if psychology is not at the table? Um, how can we use our psychological science and knowledge to um, counter or dispute inaccurate information put on media platforms by the public, for the public? What myths have been published that we can counter with data? There are disadvantages as well. The extremely quick and easy distribution of information to the public increases the potential for our messages to be misinterpreted, in part because they lack the context that many of our journal articles provide. Um, there is the risk of backlash or criticism, and often not in the courteous tone we've come to expect from journal articles. In other words, you get hate mail. Um, with media, there's the uh, increased potential for loss of privacy, your own as well as your family and friends, uh, particularly if your contact information is made available to the public or you use a public account on social media. And finally, use of media may pose ethical challenges, particularly when you don't have control over the final product. For example, you may be quoted out of context or tempted to comment on topics beyond your scope of expertise. However, I believe that the advantages of using media outweigh the disadvantages, particularly when it comes to children's books. 
Children's books are an excellent medium for social change messages. Picture books are ideal for young children, as kids between the ages of three and seven occupy a narrow developmental window during which they seek information about the world from you rather than from the internet. And as many of you know, picture books are great conversation starters and serve as wonderful vehicles for parent-child bonding. I'm sure many of you have fond memories of reading aloud to a child or being read to by a family member. Of course, every children's book author writes for two audiences, children and adults, and not just for the adults who buy and read the books to children. To paraphrase children's novelist Catherine Rundle, we write for children to arm them for the life ahead and for adults to arm them against life's heartbreaks and compromises and to remind them that they can always return to great sustaining truths. As psychologists, you too can shape public discourse using the tool of media. I've talked with you about two important social issues, systemic racism and climate change. There are many others. What is the social issue that is most important to you or to your client population? Maybe you're a rehabilitation psychologist interested in disability rights. Maybe you're a clinical psychologist who works with victims of gun violence and you want to advocate for um, common sense gun legislation. I want you to pick your social issue and then examine what psychology has to offer. And here, I'm not just talking about research findings, but the competencies that define your specialty, your skills as a psychologist, and the networks available to you. Now, think about the consumers you want to reach. Who is your message for? Identifying your consumers is important because it will influence your media platform and your content distribution strategy. If you're trying to reach busy millennial or Gen Z parents, social media posts may be the way to go. If you're trying to reach commuters in New York City, a transit ad on the subway may be more effective. If you're trying to reach young children, you can choose print media, broadcast media, or even YouTube. Now think about your individual assets which include your friends, your colleagues, your lived experience, your talents, passions, money, space, and time. Are you creative? What languages do you speak? Are you good at organizing and managing projects? Are you good at mentoring others to best use their talents? How can you leverage these assets to craft media messages for the population you want to reach? For me, my identified consumers were young children and their parents, and my individual assets included my friends, my interest in writing stories for children, and the time I had at this stage of my life and career. You will find your social change message at the intersection of these four circles. Now, how will you communicate it to the public? Like me, some of you may choose fiction. Mark Twain famously said, fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities, truth isn't. But I have to disagree with Twain. I don't think he was considering human-made truths like racism, and I don't think he was thinking about children who know that the Harry Potter stories aren't real but still contain truth. I think truth is obliged to hold and carry possibilities. Otherwise, how will the truth of climate change hold the possibility of climate justice. If you choose children's literature, I urge you to reclaim a neglected part of history or revise a myth or fairy tale to better align with the values of equity and justice. And please avoid dystopian narratives of doom and write stories of hope and action. We owe children the truth, but we also owe them the possibility of a better future. Thank you.